good evening from wherever you are. And uh, we have people joining uh, via Zoom and also via YouTube Live. So welcome everyone. And we are going to short uh, uh, to start shortly. So maybe as people join, um, I'm going to uh, slowly start the panel discussion today, introduce it. Um, welcome everyone again, uh, both on Zoom and on YouTube Live. Welcome to everyone. And so my name is uh, Alexandra kosan -Sishi. I'm a representative of Soka Gakkai International at the UN in Geneva. And as part of the Geneva Interfaith Forum on Climate Change, Environment and Human Rights, so the GIF, together with uh, Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual University, the Dominicans for Justice and Peace, Franciscans International, the Lutheran World Federation, and the World Council of Churches, we are very happy to welcome you today for a discussion focusing on human rights and climate change. Many, many thanks for joining us today. So it is now clear that the climate crisis is one of the most urgent human rights issues of our time, which really impacts both directly and indirectly the enjoyment and realization of the human rights of all. The global COVID-19 pandemic has pushed all of us to expand the way we see the world. And we really realized that there is a clear interdependence between all living beings and the environment. And as we realized that the pandemic crisis is the result of the deep imbalances that we have created in our ecosystems because of the exploitation of natural resources by a few at the expense of the many, and the extraction of wealth at the expense of nature, which really now exceed the capacity of our planet Earth to sustain us, it really is clear now more than ever that we need to take action for climate justice, putting human rights at the center. And so in this context, uh, why really climate change is, is accelerating and really demands now an urgent and coordinated response at the Human Rights Council, uh, of the UN in Geneva, which is the UN body responsible for promoting and protecting human rights, there is currently no dedicated mechanism that really tackles climate change in a holistic and systematic and consistent manner. The 46th session of the Human Rights Council has just concluded a few days ago, and during the session, uh, the permanent mission of Bangladesh delivered a statement on behalf of more than 50 states calling for effective global climate actions to promote and protect human rights. Um, and it also called uh, the Council to consider creating a new special procedure on human rights and climate change. And the GIF, the Geneva Interfaith Forum, also delivered a statement in this sense. So it is in the context, in this context, that we organize the event uh, of today. And with today's panel discussion, we really wanted to share uh, what has been happening at the Human Rights Council and to really take this opportunity to bring together voices and visions from small island states, indigenous peoples, youth, and faith communities. And so I would like to take to really take this opportunity to thank our panelists in advance for joining us today and participating in today's discussion. So we wish we could also have had more time to have more panelists and more perspective represented, but we are very happy uh, to be able to um, uh, bring together um, these various voices uh, today. Now, um, without further uh, delay, I would like to introduce our panelists and start with the first round of questions to them uh, to start the discussion. Um, in the meantime, don't hesitate to uh, share your comments or your questions, both uh, if you are in Zoom, in the Zoom chat or Q&A box, uh, and in the chat of the YouTube Live if you are on YouTube Live. So to start this discussion, I would like to invite Yves Lador, who has been working for many years on the links between human rights and climate change and the environment as a consultant and as the permanent representative of Earth Justice to the United Nations in Geneva. So Yves, 
Um, the first question is, can you explain the role of civil society in bringing the issues of the impact of climate change on human rights uh, in the context of the discussion of the UN Human Rights Council? Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, Alexandra. And, and let me first start by thanking the organizers for this event, which is indeed extremely timely, and, and for uh, inviting me to uh, to participate and uh, and share a bit of what the NGOs and the civil society and the Indigenous Peoples Organization have been doing over the last years, precisely to bring forward this uh, this need and and have this um, mandate of a special rapporteur on uh, human rights and um, and climate change. Perhaps just historically to, to set the things uh, very well, uh, the Human Rights Council uh, started to work on the issue of climate change um, in 2008 uh, with the first resolution that was proposed by the Maldives. But at that time, the issue was not at all to have a procedure, it was just to bring the issue, to put the issue on the table. And that was already quite a struggle and the Maldives succeeded uh, to bring this forward, but it was already a very, very difficult battle. Um, there was very strong resistance to try to have anything more than just a resolution. The resolution itself was already uh, difficult to maintain and to have on, on a year, yearly basis. So um, there was a debate very quickly after the resolution within the countries and within civil society on what should be the next step. And that's where civil society stepped in very strongly in 2010 at the Human Rights Council Social Forum, which was devoted in 2010 to the issue of climate change and its impacts on, uh, on human rights. Um, and that's where the civil society for the first time came out with a very strong call to create a mandate of a special rapporteur. And that was put forward and, and organized by the Franciscans International and, and Woody Tanyo, who really played a very uh, important role in leading uh, this initiative. And he has never stopped since. So. Uh, I'd like to really here to, to uh, congratulate him for the work that, he, that has been done, uh, it, because we can see now the achievement of all, uh, of all these, um, this effort. But even though the issue was included in the report of the Social Forum to the Human Rights Council, it stayed there. Obviously, there was not a very big will within the, the members of the Council to go any further and to have a special procedure. And that's why in 2012, there has been a change in strategies by the, the country who were promoting this resolution on human rights and climate change. And the Maldives uh, joined another group, uh, which created the mandate on human rights and the environment, which was a more global one, and which gathered more support than the support that we were able to have on the issue of climate change. And so that's when the, um, the, um, the issue of human rights and the environment was created with a special procedure. And it was indeed a, a clever move in the sense that there was really at that time no possibility to have anything more than just the resolution uh, at the, the Human Rights Council. So we had a first special rapporteur who was basically an independent expert, but that doesn't make any difference. It became afterwards a, a full a special rapporteur on human rights and the environment with Professor John Knox, the first mandate holder. And of course, environment includes the issue of climate change. And he did a report on the issue. He was also extremely active in the UNFCCC and in particular uh, coordinated a report of special procedures, not just him, for the, uh, the negotiation in Paris, and that had an impact and was used um, in, the, uh, in the negotiations to, for example, fix the, the target of limiting uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, to 1.5 degree uh, above the uh, average uh, temperature of the globe um, since the industrial age. So the, there the report really played a role and it's quite interesting to see that there was a, a real concrete and substantial input from coming from the special procedures from the Human Rights Council into this negotiation. And it did help the, the discussion that happened in, uh, in Paris and contributed to the outcome that we, we know today. Um, so we might wonder then why should we need a special rapporteur on, uh, on climate change? Well, precisely, because we see that the mandate has many other things uh, to deal with. The recent reports were also on water, on, on biodiversity, so many issues. So you only come back to the issue of climate change from time to time. You don't have something which is really constantly happening on, uh, on climate change. 
And so that's why the human rights uh, organization, civil society, indigenous people's organization really kept <laughs> hammering the, the, the nail to say, we need a full special procedure on human rights and climate change. And we were very happy that in 2019, in the uh, Geneva Dialogue on Human Rights and Climate Change, uh, Bangladesh came back and in a way revived this idea of having a special rapporteur and triggered a new dynamic. And that's exactly what we saw a few, days, a few days ago in the Human Rights Council. It is clear now that um, this idea is gathering real support. What is very interesting, it's gathering support from the South and from the North. And this is really a new situation in the Human Rights Council. So we have a very interesting uh, perspective. And I think it has been very, very important that civil society has always kept waving this flag, always kept putting this issue on the table, coming back on it. Otherwise, definitely, it would have gone outside of the room and probably would have not come back to it. Thank you so much, Eve. Thank you so much for setting the scene and really bringing this um, uh, overview of the historical development of the issue, which is um, yeah, so important to really remember as we continue moving forward. So thank you very much. I would like now to um, welcome Didier Georges, who is a diplomat from the permanent mission of Haiti to the UN in Geneva. And among others, he has really worked and contributed to raising the voices of small island developing states in the discussions uh, on climate change. So Didier, from the perspective of a small island state from the Caribbean region, what role do you think the UN uh, Human Rights Council should provide in protecting the human rights of the people in the small island states affected by climate change? Hi, hello, I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, perfect. Yes, great, thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. And as a person of faith, I'm happy to be here on the panel as well. Uh, quickly to answer your question, because we only have about five minutes, is one of the first things we have to do is to ask ourselves what the HRC actually is. What is the Human Rights Council? And what the Human Rights Council is, is mostly a negotiating roundtable, a space where states and can challenge one another on their ideas on what human rights means to them. And when, and when all the talking is done and all the negotiations which are done, the main outcome of all of these negotiations and in the form of a report, which was mentioned by the previous speaker, many reports that, that have come out in the past, now, do we need more expert support to tell us that the science is in, the time to act is now, climate change is an existential threat to everyone, including small and developing states? Uh, no, we don't need any more reports telling us that the time to act is now. Uh, so from the small and developing states, from what I guess specifically from a, a Haiti point of view, speaking on a national capacity, the, the current manifestation of the Human Rights Council would make the impact on, on, on climate change around the world very, very limited. And before I get to that, let me sort of set the scene for a, a little bit further. Uh, Haiti is one of 38 cities around the world, and all cities have a few things in common. We're member states with small populations, small economies of scale, limited natural resources, which is relevant to our discussion here today, and we all, are on, we all are on the front lines of climate change. And one of the most notable effects of climate change is, is sea level rise. And if you look at the political geography of mostly all cities around the world, the capital city, which is also the primate city, and it's also where most of the economic development and economic activity is held, and also where most of the populations are, are also are all on the coast. Now, as the sea level rise, everything from the economic activities to the, to the migration of people will so have to go inland, and also e even the, the fishing industry of, of all of these countries will be affected, and all livelihoods also are, will be put in jeopardy. And we all know that SIDS constitutes only about 65 million people around all three regions, uh, which is 38 countries and contribute only 1% of greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. So the role SIDS have played to basically with the current state of the world when it comes to climate change is very, very negligible. Uh, but nevertheless, we all have a collective responsibility to act and, and a duty to find solutions to our common problem. Now, as small island developing states, and I've been a diplomat here for five years, and I can say that all states are very, very big proponents of the multilateral system. This is where the Human Rights Council comes in. And for the past five years as covering the human rights, I can fairly say from my own experience, of course, uh, very, very little has, the Human Rights Council has done very, very little when it comes to human rights and climate change. Uh, if you just look at the UPR itself, the Universal Periodic Review in the past three cycles, uh, cycle one from 2008 to 2012, there are only 29 recommendations specifically mentioning climate change. In cycle two from 2012 to 2016, 
only 67 recommendations were in reference to climate change. And in the third cycle, which is still ongoing, we've made some progress. We so far made 160 recommendations on climate change. But to put it in context, this is out of over 10,000 recommendations that's either been made since 2008, since the first cycle. So 256 recommendations out of over 10,000 referencing climate change since 2008. And the 160 number so far in the third cycle is, is still very small in my opinion. What's even more worrying is that the states receiving recommendations on, on climate change and its negative impacts are also small island developing states and climate vulnerable countries. And, this, <laughs> and, and on the other side, the states making recommendations on, on climate change are also small and developing states and climate vulnerable countries, including my own country, Haiti. So, and the Human Rights Council is more, it's a little bit like an echo chamber where in, at the EPR, where it's SIDS or talking to SIDS about climate change. You know, we think about SIDS, we think about the number one issues being climate change, but when we talk about other countries, the big emitters um, and also the big, the big players, we think they have much bigger issues when it comes to human rights and climate change falls way, way, way down the list. Now we need to get ourselves out of the, this echo chamber. You, uh, Alex, you mentioned earlier that the, the Bangladesh released a statement, a joint statement, where 50 get ourselves out of the, this echo chamber. You, uh, Alex, you mentioned earlier that the, the Bangladesh released a statement, a joint statement, where 50 states signed. Uh, 50 states signed a joint statement calling for urgent action on climate change is actually very, very, very low. And more needs to be done. Now, this general malaise at the Human Rights Council is, is starting to change. I can say that, and, and the role that human rights is starting to play, it's starting to be more mainstream, yes. But of course, more needs to be done. What role it can play, uh, the current iteration and the current manifestation of the Human Rights Council, in our opinion, that role is, again, very limited, but it is a responsibility as more developing states where in the multilateral system where we do have strength in numbers to keep the world abreast of what is going on in our countries when it comes to sleep rise and climate change. And even if that is a report, release one year after year and specific specific data points mm -hmm. of what's happening in our individual countries by a special rapporteur or whatever the manifestation of a special mechanism mm -hmm. is, we still need to talk about climate change more and more because my future is not on what mm -hmm. the, my hope is not on what the Human Rights Council is today, but what the Human Rights Council will be like mm -hmm. in the future. And as these ideas manifest themselves further into every single tentacle of the Human Rights Council and the grandfathered it into the new iteration of the Human Rights Council is, we can move a lot, if we move forward very, very fast. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for bringing this uh, perspective and really the voice of the seeds um, in this very, um, yeah, based on really the experience of the multilateral uh, system uh, as in the Human Rights Council in Geneva um, firsthand. So really, thank you so much for sharing this perspective. Um, I am now happy to welcome Sister Jayanti Kirpalani, uh, who is the main representative of the Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual University um, at the United Nations. And since 2009, she has led the Brahma Kumaris delegation to the UN climate change conferences. And she has really spoken internationally about the spiritual perspectives relevant to climate change. So um, a warm welcome. And Sister Jayanti, we wanted to ask you, um, from a spiritual perspective, why would you say it is important to have a human rights mechanism studying climate change? Thank you, firstly, for this kind invitation to join all these eminent panelists. It's my great honor and privilege to join you all. And I do see that the whole subject of climate change is actually a spiritual matter. Um, on first sight, it might seem that it's a bit strange. Spirituality is maybe somewhere up there and climate change is happening as a reality in our world. But if you go back to that idea that it's human consciousness that is doing everything, that is actually stimulating whatever it is that's going on in my thinking, in my speaking, in my doing, and also in my being. So I think that if you're looking at the bigger picture of what impacts climate change, it's actually our consciousness. And if our consciousness is caught up with materialism and consumerism, um, Alexandra, you shared some interesting facts at the start of this event. And I'd just like to say that I think that actually we as a human species are using three times more 
the resources of nature that this planet can give us. And so we can't carry on like this. This word sustainable is very, very important. We are not living a sustainable lifestyle. And yes, it's also a fact that the small islands contribute 1% of the emissions. And yet they're in the front line of having to face the consequences of what the rest of us have done. And I also want to point out that the human rights um, preamble states, talks about the dignity of humankind, as does the UN Charter, as does the Charter of the UNESCO. And so spirituality addresses this whole subject of human dignity, because spirituality is the reminder that we actually have to turn inwards and connect with ourselves and when we do that through our consciousness, then we're able to rediscover things like love, compassion, justice, and truth. And if I look at the state of the world today, we find that this is very much what is missing. And sometimes we say, oh, well, you know, it's the way things are. But in fact, I think that if even a minority were to change their consciousness and come back to the original identity of the self as a spiritual being, then we're able to tap into those inner resources of truth, of love, of compassion, so that then that can be our contribution to the world. And my faith is that even a small minority that is working in conjunction together with each other, but also help from above, that minority can shift the majority and create a different state of the world. We've looked at the nationally determined um, commitments that countries have made, and it was beautiful to be in Paris and see everyone come together in that way, but of course, the reality is that very, very few countries have actually followed through on that commitment that they themselves made. And so I'm seeing that if we leave it to governments, if we leave it to international um, uh, conglomerates of industry and big business, um, they have their own system. They continue to pursue this in their own way but I feel that civil society can make a big difference. But also I feel that people of faith coming together can have a huge, huge impact because the power that we have is the power of love, the power of hope. And I think that that hope is what humanity needs to, today, but also the shift from consumerism and materialism to that which is a simpler type of life so that others can enjoy some type of basic livelihood and survival because it is now a question of survival or not. And if we come together and share this message of love and hope and faith, I think that yes, things can change. And I think it's in our hands to come together and make that difference because it's lifestyle change that requires that power from above and the love for each other, the compassion to be able to make a difference. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for bringing this very important perspective, bringing it back, uh, both actually back to the human being, um, but really acknowledging the, the community and the need to do more, um, which is very timely as we've seen that um, uh, the synthesis report gathering uh, the, the summary of uh, all the nationally determined contributions that you mentioned uh, was released in February, really showing um, that of course actions have been taken, but so much more needs to be done. Um, to really um, be able to uh, change the trend that we're going on. So thank you so much for bringing in also really the, 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 the faith perspective and um, the, the, the need to act really based on solidarity. Thank you very much. Now uh, we are going to welcome um, Aldona Purba, who is um, currently studying for a master's in applied environmental science 
uh, at Halmad University in Sweden. And uh, her thesis actually focuses on evaluating greenhouse gas emissions for a local wastewater plant. And as a member of the Batak Christian protest Protestant Church in Indonesia, she contributed to facilitate environmental education for youth um, in Indonesia. And she represents one of the um, Lutheran World Federation Voices. So welcome Aldona. And we would like to ask you if you could tell us from your point of view, how climate change is affecting the rights of future generations. And if you could also tell us from the point of view of uh, young people, why is it so important to establish a new mandate on human rights and climate change? Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, to be able to participate in this uh, discussion. Um, yeah, from a yeah, youth perspective, it's a bit complicated, I would say, because when we talk about the future generations, we talk about uh, the younger generation. And according to the UN Environment and Climate Change Survey, it was mentioned that actually 73% of the youth surveyed in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, which are areas that are vulnerable to climate change, are currently feeling the effect of climate change. So this is this is a fact that is already happening that climate change does affecting us. So if young people are affected by the climate change, then it means that we are lacking of healthier environment. Like I, I am lacking um, of having a good environment where I can improve uh, my well-being and also maximize all the potential that I have as a young person. And I see that young people have so many potential to do things in their young life. But unfortunately, in our society nowadays, uh, we have a very limited opportunities to be heard and to speak our voice. And I've seen that this is when we, we talk about the climate change effects, it's like layers of problems. So it's not only the physical things that we see what's happening in the nature, but also the complexities when it comes to society. From my faith community, for example, young people are still considered to be lacking of experience. And then also we we're immature. We, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, raise our voice talking about, oh yeah, climate change is, is affecting our future. And then it makes another problem that we have lack of discussions with our previous generations to, to, to raise awareness or to, to gain information where to start, where we can take actions for our future. So in my context uh, back in Indonesia, it's a really huge challenge. And probably this, this has a similar uh, trend in most developing countries because here in Sweden, I met uh, people from different countries and we learned in my class also how difficult it is to tackle climate change or any environmental problems. So to bring that to our context, uh, there must be like specific uh, ways to overcome that. So what I see, if young people are not given opportunity to, to speak their rights about their future life that is affected by climate change, then we, we, couldn't, we couldn't even have a chance to do something. So when climate change is affecting us, it's affecting our well-being. And if we couldn't do anything because we, we are not heard, where to start? So I think when, when we want to talk about establishing a new mandate for human rights and climate change, this is a very good thing because it allows us to have a full uh, procedure, as mentioned before, that involves the young people. So I really expect and I really hope that this, this mandate is not only uh, on papers, but it's really, it's really something that involves young people, especially young people in the vulnerable, uh, vulnerable areas. And the other um, problem is that if we want to reach people in vulnerable area, we, we have to consider their capacity also because only certain people that have opportunities to raise their voice to any higher institutions that uh, will struggle or fight for, for, for the rights 
of young people. So for me, it's, it's something that is really important <laughs> to start with. And I hope by, by having this mandate, actually young people can have more opportunities to be heard and to be noticed that we are affecting. And by that, we have the opportunities also to do actions for our own future. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for bringing this perspective and for also really highlighting how, um, as the previous speakers have said, um, that um, yeah, we don't need more reports for the sake of reports, but if there is also um, a, another yet another mechanism that can also really meaningfully engage the voice of young people, uh, this is very important, um, as you mentioned. So thank you very much uh, for contributing. Um, I would like now to welcome Beverly Longit, um, who is the Global Coordinator for the Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation in the Philippines. Um, and so uh, from your perspective, Beverly, um, we know that Indigenous peoples are really in the front line of the climate impacts. And so could you share with us how or in which ways climate change really is impacting indigenous people's rights. I think you need to be unmuted by, yes, okay. and, <laughs> and we can hear you. Thank you, um, Alex, um, for that. Um, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to speak in this uh, uh, panel. Um, I think when we look at climate change, um, we should try to understand it from the pers uh, from a, a perspective of on indigenous peoples. And now with uh, COVID, uh, climate change, and now with COVID, this has already worsened the situation of uh, exploitation, oppression, and discrimination of indigenous peoples. Um, the non-recognition of our rights to land, territories, and re resources, which is a core of our rights to self-determination and uh, development, remain largely uh, unrecognized. Now, our inclusion and participation in decision-making and uh, other processes uh, in matters that are relevant to us uh, remain uh, lacking, if not uh, absent. In Asia, many indigenous peoples remain unrecognized as uh, indigenous peoples. And then, unfortunately, tyrannical regimes, like we have Duterte in the Philippines, we have Modi in India, and now the Tatmadaw, the military junta in, in Burma, this fur further worsens this situation. So it is in this context that I would propose that we try to understand the issue of, of uh, climate change and the, its impact on indigenous peoples. Um, some very quick points. Um, I think one, uh, indigenous peoples are among the poorest of the poor. Thus, uh, we are one of the most uh, threatened segments of the world in terms of uh, social, economic, political, and environmental vulnerabilities. Um, we are only 5% of the world's population, but we constitute something like 15% of the world's uh, uh, poor population. Um, in Asia and in the Pacific, um, that are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of uh, climate change is around 80% of the population is uh, indigenous peoples. And that if you put this side by side by the data of the World Bank that come 2020, 2030, around 100 million or more would be pushed, would uh, fall into poverty. So this would imply that indigenous peoples will be one of the worst affected in terms of uh, climate change. Um, second, um, many indigenous peoples live in uh, areas that are how do you say, most vulnerable to, to climate change. We depend on the forest, on our territories, for our survival and livelihood that, will, that shall also be at risk or destroyed due to climate change. Um, in some uh, regions such as the uh, Pacific, the very existence of many indigenous peoples is under threat because of the rising um, sea levels that not only pose a grave threat to their livelihood, but to their very existence as uh, people. And of course, that comes along uh, their ways, uh, their culture and their ways of life. 
um, three in terms of uh, gender, um, gender equality will further worsen. You know? And gender equality suffered by indigenous women will be further exacerbated by climate change. So it will um, further expose or make them more vulnerable in terms of discrimination, exclusion, and exploitation. And at the same time, climate change might, will be creating new risks uh, uh, for, for women. Um, for, uh, in terms of uh, these vulnerabilities and uh, how do you say this, um, challenges or exposure to uh, climate change uh, would normally force uh, many indigenous peoples to, to move out of their communities, to migrate to the cities, to look for better jobs, not to mention probably the situation of militarization of uh, many communities in, in Asia. This would render um, indigenous peoples again, more vulnerable to discrimination, exploitation, um, and of course, environmental hazards in places where they uh, try to uh, to move in. So such mitigation migration would uh, further lead also to the loss of uh, traditional knowledge and at the same time, uh, which are essential for climate action. Um, last point, so as I mentioned, while we account for only 5% of the world population, we care for around 22% uh, of the Earth's surface and uh, according to studies, uh, our territories hold 80% of the planet's uh, biodiversity. So we have much to share in terms of forwarding solutions or how do we combat um, climate change. And I think this is very important to, to recognize so that we'll be able together with other sectors of society, be able to contribute and come up with solutions that will address climate change and at the same time also um, uh, address the issue of respect for human rights. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly. Thank you for bringing the perspective and also the important facts that you have highlighted and really mentioned, bringing also in the um, uh, gender uh, perspective that is uh, very important to um, yeah, keep, keep very clear also in the discussion and also to really recognize, as you mentioned, to really recognize um, uh, how to, uh, um, given really the impacts on the human rights of indigenous peoples to really how to continue moving and learning from uh, solutions um, uh, from really indigenous people. So thank you very much for um, sharing this perspective. Now, uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to welcome Reverend James Bakwan. Uh, who is joining us from uh, the Pacific, from Fiji. So it's an uh, evening for you. Thank you very much for joining uh, in your evening late. Uh, Reverend James uh, Bagwan is the General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches, and he has been tirelessly bringing the voices of Pacific communities uh, who are at the forefront of the climate crisis. So thank you very much for being here with us uh, today. And we would like to ask you, uh, so small island states in the Pacific and elsewhere um, have continuously been affected disproportionately by the negative impacts of climate change, as we um, heard also uh, uh, before. So what kind of human rights protection do you think is needed from the UN uh, in this context? Thank you very much, Alexandra. And um, I'll say good evening because it's uh, despite the background, it is um, uh, evening for us in, uh, in Fiji and the Pacific and greetings from uh, your Pacific family to wherever you are in the world today. I would um, perhaps begin by um, just uh, echoing what uh, Sister Jayanti said regarding the important role of spirituality in this human rights discourse. And that is because for the Pacific people, our culture and our spirituality uh, are part of our identity. And so um, it is being acknowledged that um, as we have this discourse and this call around human rights um, framings and responses to climate change, um, it's important that um, any framework that is being developed takes into account not only human rights, but culture and spirituality. And that connects to a number of different levels um, of the issue of climate change in our region um, as uh, indigenous people, as, uh, as communities that have a uh, deep, deep 
connection as all indigenous people do, but also that all spiritual people should have as well, I would imagine, with the land and with the sea, with creation. We're in a time now where climate change impacts are being exacerbated by COVID-19. And the challenges that we are facing are not just on human rights, but in the context of social, cultural, and economic rights as well. COVID-19 is exacerbating not only the rapid onsets and the slow, um, but also the slow onsets of uh, climate change impacts. We've heard earlier about sea level rise. We're also challenged by extreme weather patterns. And um, for us uh, in this region who develop uh, or depend quite a lot on the ocean, as we do around the planet for oxygen, um, there is a serious issue about the protection of the ocean as a result of um, climate change. And um, I note one of the questions about, uh, from one of our um, attendees around the issue of the rights of nature. Um, just some context, uh, in 2019, Pacific leaders have uh, recognized the need to formally secure the future of our people in the face of climate change and its impact. And at the Pacific Island leaders meeting in 2019 held in one of the most vulnerable uh, islands in our Pacific region of Tuvalu. Um, the leaders uh, noted the proposal for a UN General Assembly resolution seeking an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on the obligation of states under international law to promote the rights of present and future generations against the adverse effects of climate change. So human rights is the backstop of justice. And that again is where spirituality comes in. That is where it is important to see civil society, faith-based organizations or religious communities, spiritual communities working together in partnership to address this important issue of justice in the context of uh, climate change. At the Pacific Conference of Churches, we label our work not just in terms of responding to climate change, but as a call for climate justice. And I acknowledge the many uh, women and men, our sisters and brothers, who over the decades now have been the voice of the Pacific, whether they are government leaders, traditional leaders, faith leaders, they have constantly been calling for climate justice in the context of, uh, of uh, climate change. Human rights is about ensuring that the vulnerable are taken care of, that the most vulnerable are not uh, um, discluded from the engagement around this. And so we are calling in that context for human rights, for inclusion, participation, and consultation of those most vulnerable, be it states, also be it individuals and communities within those states. And so as we're talking about human rights, it's also important to recognize the context of um, human rights from an international perspective, but also human rights protections locally and in the domestic sense as well. And finally, very quickly, um, as I know my time is, uh, is up, to recognize that there is an intrinsic relationship of justice between human rights and the development conversation. When our people disappear because of climate change, it won't just leave cultures disappearing, it won't just leave uh, islands uh, disappearing or peoples disappearing, it will create empty oceans for exploitation, uh, be it for fish or be it deep sea mining for, um, for, for resources, for our smartphones and other things. And so this is the context in which we are calling for human rights and particularly for global justice around climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much so much, uh, James, for really bringing powerfully um, this call and the voices of the Pacific, but also really the call for um, climate justice and the yeah the broader perspective really on also really the, um, uh, uh, the, the human rights being really crucial, but really equally culture and spirituality uh, in relation to the land and really not um, forgetting these impacts as well. And also, as you mentioned, uh, so importantly, uh, that any uh, procedure or mandate that really 
should the focus should be really about the inclusion and participation of uh, really the, the all the voices, particularly affected voices, be it states or really within states communities. So to be able to really give um, these voices um, um, a, 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 a possibility to be heard and to be acted upon. So thank you so much. We are now uh, going to continue with the um, uh, second uh, round of questions to all of our panelists. Um, and thank you so much for uh, to the um, everyone who has been putting in questions and comments in the chats. Uh, we are going to um, bring into the panelists as well. Uh, but we're going to uh, first start to just with a question to expand on what has been shared by each of the panelists. And so um, I would like to go back to you, Eve. Uh, to just expand a little bit more, uh, as you mentioned, no, on the special procedure mandate on human rights and climate change, the, the, the history and the development, and so why uh, you think it's so important to have uh, such a special procedure now. Uh, and so maybe a further question would be, so what do you expect to really achieve with this mandate? Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> indeed, sorry. Three things, uh, we, the expectation we can have from this mandate. Um, first, it's um, to give a, a, a bigger voice and a bigger capacity for the frontline people. And that would include, of course, the younger generation, as it has very well been said by, uh, by Aldona, um, to have a voice directly at the international level and to be heard. And on this, I'd like to underline, underline one of the urgency we are stepping into right now. We know that the, to, to keep the, um, the global uh, increase of temperature, uh, of average temperature at you know, below 1.5 degrees uh, since the industrial age, that this, we're getting very close to it. And so close that it's not sure that we might reach it. And we can already start to hear voices who says, okay, well, it won't be 1.5, it'll be two. This has a huge impact on human rights. It means a number of people, and we're talking about thousands of people are affected by this small change because it's, it seems as a small change. But as we're talking about an average temperature on the whole planet, it's not a small change. It's a huge difference. And this is not in the discussion at all. It seems like a, a technical issue. It's not. It's a human issue. And we have to put this very clear on the table at the international level. We're very far from this. And this will be one of the very first challenge of this mandate. But I, saw, I see also two other elements. The second one is to guide states in the way they implement climate actions and climate measures, because we know also that some of these measures do bring more human rights violations because they're not done properly without clear participation and so on. And here there's a very important tool, which are the national determined contribution that were mentioned by uh, uh, Sister um, Jayanti. Um, here we have a tool where human rights must be included and there uh, the, the special rapporteur can provide guidance to civil society, to states and so on, in order to have these human rights in the national determined contribution. And finally, um, in echo to what uh, Rever Reverend um, Bagwan has just said, and actually I would also here quote another uh, important uh, Fijian personality who is Ambassador Khan, who's right now uh, the ambassador of, F of Fiji here in Geneva and who is chairing the se this year's session of the Human Rights Council. She's always underlining how much when you implement human rights in these climate measures, you also help to bring from a usually a very difficult situation to improve the, the situation of the people. And she shows, for example, how some of the measures which have been taken in Fiji have also helped when you have to displace people. But when you do the consultation properly, it has helped to empower women. It helps to increase the capacity of action of the local communities who were better heard by the governments. So actually in these dramatic situation where you have to help people from climate impact, if you have a human rights approach, you can also improve this already very negative position. And this is a very important contribution coming directly from Fiji. And I'm so happy that we have our Fiji's friends with us uh, today in, in this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, maybe uh, continuing uh, on, on this uh, discussion and with you, Didier. Um, so Haiti has been supporting the calls um, for the council to really strengthen uh, its work uh, on climate. 
um, and to really establish a dedicated special procedures on human rights and climate change in the context of what you shared. So from your perspective, um, and bearing in mind what you shared before, but from this perspective, what would you expect to achieve with really such a mandate? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I completely agree with what Mr. Lador just said in terms of what expect, expectations sh should look like. I would just like to add that one of the things that we hope for, I guess, from our own perspective is that the new incoming mandate that hopefully will pass by consensus this year, maybe the next session, will take away some of the focus from COVID-19 and reshift it back to climate change. Uh, climate change was really on the uptake before COVID-19 hit and then it completely hit the, the back burner because of COVID-19, completely justified, completely rightfully so. Um, but as outlined by some of the previous speakers today, climate change will have far more societal, economic, and political impacts than COVID-19 will ever have. The fact that we've been able to sort of cont contain this virus under a year has been quite remarkable and also show strength that what can we do, what, what the world can do when we all come together. And of course, consider the least vulnerable and, all, and of course, try, trying to find solutions that works for everyone. Uh, small and developing states actually led a joint statement the last session last year for the 45th session entitled Remember Climate Change. Uh, basically, it was a statement signed by 49 countries stating that while COVID-19 is bad and has continued to have, will continue to have ramifications in the future, uh, climate change is here to stay and will be here for decades, maybe even half centuries. Uh, so we need to start preparing for that now. And while COVID-19 will continue to be a focus for us, uh, we need to restart reshifting our focus back to climate change. And that's one of the hopes we think the new mandate will have for us once it is passed. One last thing I'd like to add is that because it's, it, it will be such a special mandate focused on climate change, it has to be a little bit different from what the previous special rapporteurs and special mechanisms. Thank you very much for um, yeah, bringing these points and really this voice that uh, yeah, we need to really have um, and act upon really um, this issue really ambitiously. Um, thanks very much. So maybe continuing with um, Sister Jayanti, also expanding on what you shared uh, previously. So what do you think could be achieved through um, a special uh, procedure mandate, so a special rapporteur, a special procedure mandate on human rights and climate change from an ethical and moral uh, perspective? Um, we've heard this word justice being brought in um, by Reverend Bhagwan, but also at other times. And so I think that if you're looking at justice as a moral and ethical perspective, um, it is absolutely immoral to continue with the lifestyles that some people have 20% of the world's population at the expense of 80% of the world's population. That's a very rough general idea. Um, so I do think that having a rapporteur who's dedicated or maybe as, um, as was pointed out, maybe we need to have two or three um, who have special expertise and they bring their talents together to work this out. Um, so I think that if we're looking at a world in which there's proper civilization, surely the foundation of civilization is justice. And so justice becomes a factor in which we are really focused now if we're looking at human rights and the rights of every single person on the planet um, to be able to have a decent life, to have a life of honor, of dignity. And so this is why I think it's a very important step forward to bring in two, three rapporteurs who can do this. Um, I also want to bring in the subject of dignity again, because it is not right that we should expect people to give up their culture, their history, and move away from those small islands. I know that in some places, people have been offered space in, on the mainland, in um, Australia or New Zealand, for example, and possibly other places in the Caribbean that I'm not aware of, um, but you're expecting them to uproot not just a family, but it's thousands of years of culture and tradition. And when they move to another place, yes, they have survival, but what happened to the legacy that they've been trying to hold on to? And so I think that, again, it's a matter of human rights that we allow that possibility of legacy to continue. And so I think having a rapporteur is very, very important, or two or three rapporteurs. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sister Jayanti. Um, indeed, these are all really elements that are important um, and really contributing to the reflection of um, you know, what, what should be addressed uh, or what um, should be um, a yeah, part of this mandate uh, in terms of uh, what it should really uh, focus on and, and what it should take into account. And this um, aspect of justice, dignity, and really culture and history that you and really um, several of uh, our speakers have mentioned are really key. Um, maybe uh, we continue with you, Aldona, and also expanding on what you have shared. So really from the point of view of uh, young people, uh, yeah, what would be, you, you shared a little bit on that already, but what would be the key recommendations on the creation of um, such a new mandate and from your perspective and also what would be the challenges uh, for young people to participate and really give inputs um, to this new mandate? Yeah, so the key, uh, most important key recommendation I would say is, is to support uh, young leadership especially in uh, vulnerable areas and like rural areas where young leaders are usually uh, limited to access of information, access of internet. And it's really important to build their capacity buildings and to make them feel confident enough that their voice, their voice is, is heard, especially in faith communities. I've experienced and I've seen like uh, young faith leaders they have this kind of like limited opportunities to speak uh, something, if not not only climate change, but things that they want to, to, to do in their leadership role in faith communities. And the second, I would say the, the other important thing when we have this mandate is a clear mechanism where we can connect faith communities also with a technical, um, expertise. What I mean by that, because in Indonesia, for example, in areas that are lacking of water, uh, young leaders like young pastor in certain areas, they don't know how to, to do to provide clean water for the communities. And so they have to find a way to, to meet this technical expertise experts to, to, to help them to build to build what they can actually concretely can do for the community. So I think that's really important. If we emphasize on the young leadership and then we provide them with information and access to knowledge and access to meet, to discuss with um, technical experts so that they can do something that is concrete. And the other challenge also is I would say um, capacity building is still uh, limited and is still lacking among young people. For example, if you want to have international projects or programs, and then you come to like areas where they don't even speak English, how, would, how can they read the, the proposal? How can they write proposals? But they are the most vulnerable people. So I think it's always important to bring to the context and provide the young leaders so the young leaders can be the bridge for the international programs or institutions to, to, to connect. Otherwise, it will just piece of papers and these vulnerable people, they don't get access because they're lacking of knowledge. They don't even understand how to write the proposal. So it's really important. We have sources, we have the money. I think there's so many grants already <laughs> around the world and to support, let's do something for climate change. And then you come to a village where the leader, they can't speak English, they can't raise their voice. So pay attention also to that kind of thing because we want to make it for everybody. It's not just for highly educated people. It's not just for English speaking persons to be part of this uh, effort to make, to make uh, climate change as human rights. That's my biggest concern as a representative of young people. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. And all the elements that you have all shared are really important. And we, we are also, um, that's why we're also recording the, the panel today, but we are also really going to keep these elements and 
really um, um, yeah, keep bringing them in the conversations um, because they are ab absolutely crucial. So um, maybe let me continue with um, also a second question to you, Beverly, uh, about um, from what you shared, really how, from your perspective, the Human Rights Council can really protect the rights of indigenous peoples uh, in the context of climate change. Um, thanks, uh, Alex. I think one, I would support the creation of a special procedure uh, mandate holder under the UNHRC, because by doing so, it also be a recognition within the United Nations of the urgency of the issue that indeed we are in a situation of climate um, emergency. And probably two, uh, by doing so, it will also be able to recognize that when we speak of climate change, this is also a human rights issue. I mean, the human rights and nature are not two things that are in contradiction of each other, but they are actually um, linked. So probably if we have this special uh, mandates uh, within the UN, is we are able to show, show clearly the link between uh, the causes of uh, climate change and the violations of indigenous people's rights or human rights in general, especially when we try to address issues of mining, destructive mining, energy plantations, and uh, all of these uh, things. So uh, there will be more debate and probably it will be another uh, arena for marginalized people like us to be able to bring out our concerns. And then um, another issue probably that I'd like to, to raise in this because at this time that we're coming out with um, solutions to climate change, there are many who also come out with so-called green solutions or blue solutions. And, uh, and there's also this idea of establishing more conservation areas. And uh, I think this should be closely scrutinized uh, within and outside of the UN, within and outside of our um, churches, our communities, because I think we should not also allow these so-called solutions to lead to further uh, violations like dispossession of indigenous peoples and killings of indigenous peoples, such as what we are now experiencing in the Amazon, in Africa, and, uh, and elsewhere. No? So these are things that I think we should be able to, to do so. So uh, I saw one question on what can we do? Probably on Sunday, uh, as far as uh, our um, faith-based communities are concerned, I would also like to see, like when I go to church on Sunday or attend evening prayers, is to see also, you know, our pastors speaking about climate, about lifestyle change, about human dignity, about the integrity of creation and... Uh, probably these uh, things that we're holding, uh, having right now would also be helpful within the faith, uh, equipping our faith-based um, community with the knowledge and the capacity to be able to speak this, speak about this from their pulpit uh, when they do so. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much uh, for um, expanding on, on these points and for also um, um, acknowledging already some of the questions uh, that come in the chat uh, to which we're going to come soon. Um, maybe James also expanding on what you shared. Um, so yeah, it's really about expanding on what you shared about what do you think should be the role of the hum Human Rights Council really uh, in protecting the human rights of the people of uh, small island states affected by climate change. Um, so maybe expanding uh, on what you shared about really the role um, of the Human Rights Council um, in really protecting uh, the rights of um, uh, small island uh, uh, states and communities. Thank you, Alexandra. I'm, I'm hopeful uh, based on what we've heard tonight or today from the panelists. Uh, I thank Yves uh, for his uh, sharing. Um, I, like uh, Didier and others, uh, think that it should be more than just one person. But I am mindful of what the Human Rights Council can actually achieve. And we have to be honest in that sense and not just leave everything to the Human Rights Council because there are ongoing human rights violations every day that we are not able to address. And so we need to, to be very mindful of that and how things can be separated if we uh, uh, um, 
do separate into categories. But of course, I think it's important that we, we champion and we continue to push for um, climate change to be uh, addressed at, uh, at the global level through the UN systems and mechanisms. The Human Rights Council is, is, is one of those. Um, uh, with um, Fiji having a, um, uh, a role now in the Human Rights Council with um, Ambassador Shamim uh, being the president of the council. And um, she has worked um, while she was based in, in Geneva last year. We were part of a, a technical advisory group on Pacific climate change, migration, and human security, um, which was um, formed by um, the UN Office of the Human Rights uh, Commissioner for the Pacific, the uh, IOM, ILO, and other agencies, and the Pacific Islands Forum. So already there is work being done. And um, I think this is the important thing, uh, that there is a lot of work being done in our developing, small island developing states. And really some of this just needs to be collected and brought to the attention um, of the Human Rights Council, uh, rather than reinventing and going out on fact-finding missions. We've heard already, you don't need any more science to, to show what is happening in the context of climate change. And we are already experiencing the, the impacts of climate change. We are already having to relocate communities as a result of climate change. Um, we're already seeing gaps in those relocation programs. We're already seeing the lack of dignity in these processes. We're already um, seeing the challenge between what we in the Pacific Conference of Churches call between uh, relocation, forced migration, um, or forced, forced relocation in the context of exile, whereas Sister Jayanti said they are completely dislocated and, and uprooted. Uh, from the places that their very being gets its sense of identity and power from. And uh, more than just survival, the flourishing of people. But at the same time, if we take into account um, human rights perspectives, cultural perspectives, spiritual perspectives, um, and recognize that we as human beings are holistic beings, um, there is an opportunity that this, instead of being uh, a threat of exile actually becomes, uh, from, from our perspective, an opportunity for exodus, where we are able to see people move with dignity if they have to move. Nobody wants to move from their islands. That's the reality. Uh, but the reality also is unless countries change, unless polluting countries change, unless our lifestyle changes, uh, this will be the reality. And so um, it, it's very important that we, we ensure the dignity, we ensure the flourishing. And so those aspects of human rights, culture, spirituality really need to be recognized as, um, as core values. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, so thank you very much for um, all the questions that you have um, uh, answered now already and we um, have received several comments and questions in the different uh, chat box so I would like to now maybe um, yeah, give you back the floor uh, with um, um, a, a summary uh, of several questions so there are um, maybe really questions relating to um, the, the, maybe the, the faith and spiritual and maybe role of faith-based organization um, aspects uh, and how really um, so maybe, for instance, one question from Arthur Dahl is that really in front, uh, of really facing the confrontation of powerful vested interests. So in this um, materialistic economy, um, how can really religions and um, vulnerable groups and communities and maybe also like really um, seeds can unite their voices so to really counteract um, the uh, vested interests. So. Um, maybe going back to the idea of climate justice. And there is also another question uh, from uh, Joy Kennedy about um, really the rights of nature. So you mentioned the rights of nature as well. And where does that come in um, uh, in terms of maybe really focusing on human rights and climate change and a special procedure mandate? Um, and um, so maybe... Um, Yes, and there is also so also in this 
part of really maybe faith and spirituality and um, really, uh, yeah, eco-spirituality in a way, how can we really, and I think Beverly, you did address a little bit that, but really how can we maybe revive and promote um, this um, environmental ethics uh, revival and as climate actions in our communities at community and national levels? So th that would be maybe a first set of question. Um, and then, um, we can uh, then after uh, move to maybe some other technical questions. Um, would you, is there anyone who would like to um, start by, by sharing thoughts or answers or perspective? Sister Gianti? Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'd just like to say that I think that the unified approach of all the different faith traditions is a very important way to raise consciousness and awareness within people, but also to reach governments. Because I think that when um, they see that it's a number of people from all the different parts of their um, population, then I think it's inspiring for the governments to know that they're going to be supported if they were to take steps in the right direction. Um, at the moment, sometimes it feels as if um, steps are not being taken in the right direction, but rather they're going in the other way. And so I think our unity, and I think um, faith traditions have been coming together very beautifully in interfaith gatherings at the um, COP events for the last many, many years now. But I think that our own friendship and togetherness can actually make a huge difference. And the other thing is that um, I can feel that um, COVID is one aspect, um, the bereavement that people have felt and the separation and isolation but I think that what's going to happen over the next little while is that we're going to see the financial impact of COVID, the economic repercussions. And so that's a squeeze on people anyway. But I think also as climate disasters gather pace, because I'm seeing that this is what is happening. You know, um, there's things that are going on all the time and it's getting worse and worse. And I think that because of this also, people are going to be very, very aware and alert and are going to want to bring about some changes. So this is also, I see, part of the hope that I have for the future, that people will begin to understand that it's humans who have created the problem. And it's humans who have to put right the problem also. I don't think it's a question of intervention from above, but it's us. And so I think that um, as we educate people, make people aware of the consequences of lifestyle and the impact of this, I think that we can bring about change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, on this just on this first question really relating to um, really how can religions and vulnerable groups um, maybe from also um, seeds can unite their voice to counteract this vested interest. Um, I was wondering whether um, James, you wanted to contribute uh, something here. Thank you. Um, I think in the Pacific, we, we're trying very hard to manifest this, um, this process. And uh, while it is important for, for spiritual communities to come together, I think all of our um, common agencies in terms of civil society, the NGO community, um, and sometimes there's been a concept contestation of space. Uh, and this really um, is, is regards to sharing power, to empowering others, etc. cetera. But um, it has been good for us in the Pacific to see regionally civil society, faith-based communities um, coming together to engage with governments, um, to um, work together to get into the space and, um, and um, recognize that although we speak different languages, and I don't mean um, indigenous languages um, or heart languages, I'm talking about the language of spirituality, the language of civil society, the language of policy, but we're, when we sit together, we're able to articulate the same concerns. And so it's important that um, for, for us to work together, that, that we all need to come together 
um, and, and, and really work together because um, while some of us focus on a particular area that is connected to climate change or climate justice, um, another part of, our, of the group can be focusing on, on another aspect and are able to share that with us. And that way, not only are we not leaving anyone behind in the conversations, are we being inclusive in the conversations, we're also looking at it from a multifaceted point of view. And we are able to see agendas that would otherwise be hidden from, from us. And so that's very important because um, as the question asked, there's some very big players here who are you know, looking at other things apart from our lives. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, absolutely. Yes, if you want to, please. Um. Yes, well, thank you. Um, I'd like to jump in this uh, part of the discussion as uh, not representing a faith-based organization, uh, precisely, because I think we have witnessed from outside, if I can use this word, uh, the strength of this common effort by the, uh, by the faith-based communities. And I really agree with what has been said, both by uh, Sister Janti and, and Reverend uh, Bagwan, really. Uh, I would just like to say two things on that. First, one of the strengths, in addition to what has been presented, is also the relationship you have with communities directly in the field. And also what Aldona has said uh, just before is a very good representation of that. Uh, not all of the people who are involved in this discussion, not all of the different constituencies have this connection directly with the people who are living these issues in the field. And so this is extremely important. Um, and the, but there's another thing, and, and it's a bit of a warning. Um, it's very important that the faith-based, ex the expression of the faith-based groups stays in the hands of the faith-based groups. We do see that there is a will or, or a wish from powers, uh, basically from state powers, but I'm sure economic powers will also step in to try to start to speak in place of the faith-based groups because they do understand the power uh, of your words. And I think this is extremely important that it remains fully a faith-based expression. And, and as you have done over the last years and it's been really an amazing uh, contribution. Thank you very much, Eve. Um, Beverly, you wanted to add something maybe? And there is also, ju ju just for you to know, there is also really maybe this, this question about really, um, yeah, what are we doing to really promote the rights of nature? And so, because you also, um, um, uh, from that perspective, maybe um, might want to add something. I'm also just bringing it now in the discussion. Um, thanks, Alex. Uh, yes, I would agree you know, with the, the role of the church because the, our faith base, you, are, you find yourselves already in the communities. So you have uh, this really great role and in bridging the gaps in terms of um, information and understanding of the, the issue of uh, climate change. Um, two, it's really also very important that we are able to forge what we say um, coalitions or alliances between everybody, you know, the stakeholders uh, in the relation to this uh, issue. But um, well, uh, from the perspective of indigenous peoples, um, much of the causes of climate change are actually these destructive so-called development projects such that cause massive deforestation and, and pollution. So I think it also would involve to, to, to support campaigns that stop these um, uh, destructive um, practices in relation to extractives, energy, and, uh, and uh, plantations. And that puts us again into the question like, um, uh, when you speak of uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, mother nature rights, we also speak of um, human rights. As, as I've mentioned earlier, these are not contradictory with each other. From the perspectives of indigenous peoples, I mean, land is life um, speaks <laughs> of that kind of principle, of that kind of lifestyle, uh, putting into consideration the not only of current generations, but the, the young generations and future um, generations. So let's not make it uh, an issue of putting these things um, uh, uh, in contradiction um, with each other. Mm. One of the things that we have really, um, uh, what you call this experience when it comes to climate change, when we are dislocated from our territories, is that alongside with that comes also the loss of um, traditional knowledge, the loss of um, traditional practices because you, it's already, we, we've 
we are uprooted from the communities. And with that also comes the loss of viable um, solutions that we can do uh, in relation to, um, to, 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 what do you call this, in relation to, uh, to uh, climate change and uh, in human rights. Um, I think it's still an ongoing debate because some would really, what, what do you call this, dissect the issue that this is only for environment, this is for people, this is for workers, etc. cetera. But um, uh, I think uh, one of the things that I like with faith-based um, communities is that it's also a multi-sectoral um, uh, 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 call this um, aggrupation by itself. You have the women, you have the youth, you have the elders, you have workers, and so in in that sense, uh, we are able to address um, a wide um, range of people who might have different opinions, different uh, experiences in relation to this issue. So, the church, together with non-government organizations and civil society, would really have to come together, put their acts together, and uh, be able to uh, serve as a unifying agent when it comes to these issues because the, the enemies of environment are stronger than, than us at the moment. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, I see you, Eve, and I think also Sister Gianti, you wanted to add something. Maybe let me just um, recognize all the questions and comments uh, really important that are coming in the chat. So thank you so much. Um, maybe just before giving you the floor, Eve, and then Sister Gianti, I just wanted to maybe recognize maybe kind of two important uh, uh, questions or like summary uh, in the short time we have remaining, but maybe one thing that would be um, really maybe for you, Didier and Eve about, there was a question really about how to ensure that scientists and religious and cultural experts can really work together to um, find the most effective way forward. Uh, so in the context of what we've uh, spoken in the context also of the Human Rights Council, and then there, there will be also one question maybe relating to um, in terms of to Aldona, maybe in terms of uh, barriers and possibilities uh, for influences from youth um, who have to be and who are part of the transformation, who actually have led uh, many transformations. So what possibilities really do you see in uh, creating um, yeah, or co-creating platforms for youth to meet really um, older generation? really have an intergenerational perspective uh, so that we can really advance together. So as if uh, you take the floor and maybe then Sister Janti, but also Didi and Aldona, you can maybe uh, yeah, uh, have this question in mind. So Eve, please. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, the, <clears throat> the first point I wanted to, to react was just to add to what uh, Beverly has just said about this relationship between uh, environment, the rights of the environment as such and, and, and human rights. Um, first thing is the, the I'd like to underline the, the importance of the report that has been published uh, last fall uh, by the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, uh, Professor David Boyd, on human rights and biodiversity. Um, I think it's a very good document to use as a start uh, for a discussion on such an issue. Uh, it does make the linkages, and, and I think it's a very, very interesting document. So um, I really encourage everybody to have a, to give a look at this um, at this report. And another thing is that we are also hoping to have this year not only the nom nomination of the special rapporteur on uh, human rights and climate change, but also to have before the end of the year uh, the recognition of the right to a healthy and sustainable uh, environment at the level of the Human Rights Council. Now, it's something which has been widely already recognized at the national levels. Um, it has also been widely developed in the regional uh, systems, uh, regional human rights systems, but it has not been yet acknowledged as such at the universal level. And the very first step would be to have such an acknowledgement at the Human Rights Council. So we do count uh, on our friends like uh, DJ and, and, and other states um, to push this forward. Uh, there, has, there was also a very important statement at this session of the Human Rights Council, where the states who are behind this made a, a great statement saying they're going forward and, and how they see the next steps. And that was supported by more than 60 other states. So the signs are pretty good. So we do hope to be able to achieve this. And that will be also another type of link between human rights and, and the environment. And finally, on the issue of science, 
that was mentioned, I think precisely what we're talking about right now, having the special rapporteur on climate change and also having a, a joint work with the other existing procedures who directly relate in the Human Rights Council with environment issues. Of course, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, but also the Special Rapporteur on the Adverse Impact of uh, Hazardous Substances on Human Rights. These three uh, procedures, if they work together, can bring a lot, also with a link with science. I think this is very important. And what is also very important is to see that today UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program, is precisely focusing on what they call the three crises, pollution, climate change, and the loss of biodiversity. If we have also these three procedures now at the Human Rights Council, this will help to give much more coherence to the work which is done at the international level, and that can help us to go forward. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I wanted to show the linkage between spirituality that all the faith traditions have and also Mother Nature because what's been happening over the last couple of hundred years is that traditional systems and rituals that reminded us that we are the stewards of the earth, all that has vanished through commercialization and the pace of modern living. And it's so important to remember that every tradition has actually emphasized respect for the sanctity, the sacred form of nature. Um, we didn't make nature, but yet nature is what has fed us and sustained us for millennia. And we've not shown any gratitude, rather it's just been exploitation and aggression against nature. And spirituality reminds us that whatever's going on inside is what goes on outside also, inside out. And so when I lose respect for myself, because I've forgotten my own spiritual identity. And so I've lost touch with the truth and love and peace that lies within. I don't actually respect myself. This is why you have the problems that you do in the world today, starting with inferiority complexes, loss of identity and confusion about identity, low self-esteem, addictions, the whole slew of problems that come about because of this lack of self-respect and disconnect with my own inner core values. And when I don't have respect for myself, I don't respect other people and you see violence. I don't respect animal life. And so again, you see violence against animals. I won't go into that territory, but mm -hmm. it also then means that there's violence against nature. Mm -hmm. But when I come back to my spiritual identity and connect with my own core values, then the domino effect of this reaches out to nature. So I learn to treat nature with respect. And I think that that is a basic right that we owe nature. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm being mindful of the time and we have about two minutes left. So um, I would like to maybe give the floor to Didier uh, and then maybe uh, Aldona uh, for uh, maybe brief um, answers. Yes, thank you, and I'll be as brief as possible. Um, really, when it, when it comes to climate change, uh, the scientists and the religious leaders really, really go hand to hand on this issue. The science is, is telling us with all the data and the numbers that the time to act is now, and we have very little time before we reach a threshold where we can't really go back to a world where the, the acceleration of global climate change really starts to, starts to decrease. Uh, and, and all the religious leaders, what they do, since they're really close to uh, the people are really close to, uh, they're on the ground, they're experts on the ground, they really bring the human aspect to this, the human face to the suffering and the issues that are going on on the ground. So we really need the numbers and what the numbers really show on the ground is the religious aspect and, and the community leaders are telling us that. And, and the perfect example is this panel here today. Uh, what the divergence comes in is that the scientists are telling us most of the answers rely in, in technology. And of course, with technology comes out of different sort of issues. And of course, there's a financial aspect to that. And this technological transfers and capacity building is a whole nother issue. And then the religious leaders tell, and then as, as a, another example is also here today, that the real answer comes from a change in our own personal lives. And so this sort of a <laughs> dual positions dual, um, in how the solution really is. And of course, both are very, very relevant. Both are very, very needed. And where that converged here at the Human Rights Council from a state perspective, since states are 
primarily responsible for human rights, but promotion and protect human rights in their own countries, no matter what, what the government looks like, they do have that responsibility is to really bring the technological aspect of it from the scientific side and the human aspect of it. Technological aspect of it is economic development, trying to, of course, trying to see what the best way to finance certain greenhouse, uh, trying to really find ways to limit greenhouse gas emissions from our own countries, trying to reach their targets, their national targets that they've established, and also trying to work with the community leaders and see what the real impacts are and also how to sort of mitigate those impacts on the ground. Very, very hard things to do from a state perspective. And of course, the Edwin Rice Council, once the resolution passed for this mandate, all, all hands on deck needs to be on here to really show that the problem is here and a different solution to the problem and how to best solve it from a state's perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Aldona, um, yes, we give us some time. Yes, yes uh, to, to answer Beatrice's questions, I think with the help of internet and technology nowadays, the, platforms it, it's, uh, the platform itself is easily formed. So try to, to encourage young people to, to have network, to have the networks with other people, not only from their faith communities. And what I think the most important is try of to find a platform or create a platform that's directly related to the professional development of the young people, because this is what we need in our uh, productive age that we want to be, to have a good job, we want to find a job. And so try to combine the platform where young people can uh, explore their creativity to talk with the older generations, but at the same time, they also enhance their skills and their professional uh, skill that they will need in the future. So this is, uh, well, good to get this will go together to have to make a, a good platform for young people yeah thank you very very much uh for all your uh, engagement today and for um also the wonderful engagement of the audience in the question and answers maybe really um uh, so, yes, a, a big thank you to all of you um, panelists who have really brought us some absolutely crucial and key elements, I think, that will really continue to enrich the conversations to come uh, in the context of the Human Rights Council, but also really in the context of our continued work with um, our communities. And maybe one thing that really a uh, general feeling from uh, what appeared in the chat was that really there is, it's so important to now promote concrete change and youth, indigenous peoples, communities in the small island developing states have really a key role to play here. Um, and so uh, with this, I would like to really thank you all for um, joining today. I would also really like to uh, thank the, um, uh, my colleague organizing, but also uh, very much the Lutheran World Federation um, colleagues who have been uh, amazingly putting the technical aspects, which is so important for us to be able to bring our voices together. So thank you very much. Um, and um, we wanted to maybe finish with a, a, a brief minute of silence in, in really showing respect for um, the dignity of life that we uh, have really mentioned today. And just before that, I would like to take this opportunity that maybe you know, but uh, we are also currently in the midst of the 28th session uh, of the working group uh, of experts uh, on people of African descent, who is really uh, discussing the issue of environmental uh, justice um, which related to many things that we have discussed. And this afternoon from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time, there is the last uh, session and the previous session of yesterday and the day before available on UN Web TV. So it might also be interesting uh, for some of us and some of you. With this, uh, I would like to really thank you once again. And um, if you agree, maybe we'll go into a one minute of silence before closing. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I wish you all a uh, rest, uh, great rest of the day or night. Thank you for joining um, from uh, uh, all over the world uh, and um, have a yes, a good rest of the day or uh, night. Thank you very much. Thank you.